In this lecture, we are going to continue our study of direct proofs. In our last lesson, we proved statements of this form P then Q using the direct proof. What is the direct proof? Again, we assume P and then in the end, we showed that Q is true. In this lesson, we consider direct proofs when the premise or the conclusion of your implication is a compound statement. So, for example, in this one, your premise is a conjunction. This is just saying that you assume that the premise R and S are true and show that the conclusion T is true. In this lesson, we will be tackling more with these two kinds. We want to prove implications wherein the premise is a disjunction or the conclusion is a disjunction. Let us proceed by proving something of this form. Take note that some problems break down into natural cases. Here are some common examples. For instance, integers can be either odd or even. Real numbers or integers can be positive, negative, or zero. Numbers can be zero or non-zero. Real numbers can be rational or irrational. Sets can be empty or non-empty. And sets can be finite or infinite. As I have mentioned earlier, we are going to prove an implication by breaking the assumption to several cases. That is, suppose that our premise is a disjunction R or S. Recall that this implication R or S implies Q is equivalent to this statement. R implies Q and S implies Q. We have seen this in our activity in one of our synchronous sessions. So basically, what this is saying is that in order to prove this, what do we do? We have to prove R implies Q and S implies Q. This is just an implication. So meaning to say, we will divide our proof into two cases. For the first case, you assume R and then show that Q is true. For the second case, you assume S and then show that Q is also true. Once you have done this, you have shown for this part that R implies Q. For this part, you have shown that S implies Q. Since you were able to show both of this are true, you were now able to prove that this implication here is true, thus showing that this statement is true. Of course, it is very much possible that you have more than two cases. Suppose you, you want to prove P implies Q, but then P can be broken down to several cases. Suppose that we have K cases. What you just need to do is to separately prove that RI implies Q for each I. If you have done that, it means that you have already proven P implies Q. This is just a generalization of what we had over here. That is, we were showing that R1, R2, up to RK implies Q is equivalent to R1 implies Q and R2 implies Q and so on until you reach RK. Now take note that if you're going to use proof by cases, you should be absolutely sure that all cases are covered. So for example, you are proving something for integers. And then you are saying that you have case 1, x is positive, and then case 2 you have x is negative. So if that is the case, you did not cover all possibilities because you forgot the case that x can be equal to 0. Here is our first example. If n is an integer, then n squared plus 3n plus 5 is an odd integer. Take note that if we just look at n being an integer, it's difficult to get that n squared plus 3n plus 5 is an odd integer, correct? So what is the most natural thing to do here? What we will do is that we will divide this premise into two cases. That is, n is odd or n is even. Our 
cases is exhaustive because an integer is either odd or even. So let us start. Of course, we will start with our premise. Let n be an integer. Then you now write your first case here. Assume n is odd. And of course, for our second case, assume that n is even. So for the first case, assume n is odd. So that means there exists an integer k such that n is equal to 2k plus 1. Plugging this in to this one, we get that n squared plus 3n plus 5 is equal to 2k plus 1 squared plus 3 times 2k plus 1 plus 5. This is 4k squared plus 2k plus 1 plus 6k plus 3 plus 5, so that's 8. Or, that's 4k squared plus 8k plus 9. Remember that our goal is to write this as an odd integer. So therefore, we want to write it as 2 times something plus 1. And what is that? We can write this as 2k squared plus 4k plus 4 here. So that I just have 8 plus 1 here. That is 9. So I just added this plugging in this value we get. And then what is our conclusion? Thus n squared plus 3n plus 5 is odd. For the second case, assume n is even. So I will leave this as an exercise. The proof should be very much similar to what we had over here. And then you should be able to conclude here that also n squared plus 3n plus 5 is odd. In both cases, you have shown that n squared plus 3n plus 5 is odd. It means that you have proven that if n is an integer, then n squared plus 3n plus 5 is an odd integer. So let me just write it here. So we can just say in both cases, n squared plus 3n plus 5 is odd. That concludes our proof. For our next example, we have to define first the meaning of parity. Two integers m and n are said to be of the same parity if they are either both even or both odd. If one of them is even and the other is odd, we say that they are of opposite parity. So for this example, let m and n be integers. If m and n are of the same parity, then m plus n is even. Now take note that the premise here, m and n are of the same parity, this can be broken down to two cases, correct? And our cases would be m and n are both odd, and the other one is that m and n are both even. For both of these cases, we have to show that m plus n is even. Again, we start with our premise. Let m and n be integers. And our premise that m and n are of the same parity. So suppose m and n are of the same parity. I will do the first case when... M and N are both even. So for the first case, assume M and N are both even. That is, there exist integers K and L such that M is equal to 2K and N is equal to 2L. Take note that I no longer wrote that by definition of odd integers. I am just assuming now that my reader already knows the reason for this one. So hence, m plus n is equal to 2k plus 2l, which is equal to 2 times k plus l. Therefore, m plus n is even. For the first case, I have shown that m plus n is even. For case 2, I will leave it up to you as an exercise. 
That is, you have to show that if m and n are both odd, then m plus n is even. For our next example, suppose that exactly two of the integers r, s, and t are even. We want to show that 3r plus 5s plus 7t is odd. If we look at this premise, exactly two of the integers r, s, and t are even. What will be our cases here? Our cases would be r and s are even. And then, of course, the remaining one should be odd. t is odd. And then the second one is that r and t are even. And s is odd. And lastly, s and t are even with r being odd. This will be your cases. I will only prove the first case and then the second and third case will be left as exercise again. So let us start with our proof. Let us start with our premise. Suppose r, s, and t are integers. It says here that they are integers. And assume that exactly two of them are even. So I will just prove case one. Assume r and s are even and t is odd. Of course, you can invoke the parts wherein, uh, what is that? S, R and S are even and that the product of an even and an odd number, 3 and 5 are odd numbers, so that means that this is odd, this is odd as well. And then T is odd, 7 is odd, and the product of two odd numbers is odd. And then the sum of three odd integers is odd. You can do that. However, I will just proceed with the usual technique wherein we write R and S as the product of an integer and 2. And the same is true for T, 2 times an integer plus 1. So we have there exist integers M and an L such that r is equal to 2m, s is equal to 2n, and t is equal to 2l plus 1. Thus, we have 3r plus 5s plus 7t is equal to 3 times 2m. We're just plugging in plus 5 times 2n plus 7 times 2L plus 1. And this is equal to 6M plus 10N plus 14L plus 7. We want to show that this is odd. So we have to write this as 2 times something. That something has to be an integer plus 1. So therefore, what should we write here? We have here 6M. So this is 3M plus 5N plus 14L, so that's 7L. But you still have 7 in here, and I want a 1 in here. So we write 7 as 6 plus 1, so we still have a 3 inside our 2. And therefore, this is odd. And again, for these two cases, this is left as an exercise. Before we proceed with our next example, let us first discuss the division algorithm. This is a theorem, but we will not um, prove this at, this at this moment. However, it's good that we know this theorem. For any integers a and n with a not equal to 0, there exist unique integers q and r such that a is equal to n q plus r and r is strictly greater than or equal to 0 but less than n. Take note that this is just our usual divisor quotient and remainder. The integer n is a divisor of n, the integer q is the quotient, and r is your remainder. So for example, 23. The quotient when we divide 23 by 4 is equal to 5, and then the remainder is 3. 5 is our quotient, 
4 is our divisor, and 3 is our remainder. However, if we consider negative 23, we can also write this as 4 times negative 5 minus 3. Can we say that the quotient is negative 5 and the remainder is negative 3 if we look at this one? This is not the remainder because negative 3 is not greater than or equal to 0. If negative 3 is not the remainder, then how do we write it in this form? It says that we can always do this even if a is an integer because it says here for any integers a and n. So in order to find that one, I will just continue with what we have here. This is negative 5 times 4 plus negative 3. I will write negative 3 as negative 4 plus 1. And therefore, I now get negative 6 times 4 plus 1. So if that is the case, we now have that negative 6 is our quotient and 1 is our remainder and take note that the theorem is saying that this quotient and remainder is unique this means that there is no other way of writing negative 23 as 4 times an integer plus another integer where that integer is 0 1 2 or 3 next let us define congruence of integers suppose that we have three integers a b and n we say that a is congruent to b modulo n and we write it as this a is equivalent to b mod n if n divides a minus b now take note that this is a definition whenever we have a definition it actually means if and only if however for most definitions they just say if but again take note that all definitions are by conditional statements for example, we have that 8 is congruent to 3 mod 5 because 5 divides 8 minus 3, which is 5. What else? We have 13 is congruent to 1 mod 2 because 2 divides 13 minus 1. What does it mean if two integers are congruent modulo n. Let us recall that by the division algorithm, we can write b as n q plus r for some integers q and r where q and r are unique. So let me just write that. There exist unique integers such that b is equal to nq plus r, and of course, r is between 0 to n. Let us now suppose that a is congruent to b mod n. This means that n divides a minus b, which means that a minus b is equal to n times an integer. So let's call that k. So we now have that a is equal to b plus nk, and then I will substitute b equals nq plus r here. So I have nq plus r plus nk. I can now write this as n times k plus q plus r. Look at the form of a. Let me just write this here a is equal to n times k plus q plus r. We were able to write a as n times an integer plus r, where r is between 0 to n. This r here is the same r here, right? Because I got that from b is equal to nq plus r. What is this and this saying? This is saying that a and b have the same remainder when you divide it by n.
Hence, another way to think about congruence is that two numbers are congruent if they have the same remainder when divided by n. When we divide by 2, there are only two remainders, and that remainder is either 0 or 1. So every integer a is either odd or even. When a is congruent to 0 mod 2, we say that a is even. And when a is congruent to 1 mod 2, a is odd. What does a congruent to 0 modulo 2 mean? That means 2 divides a and that is exactly the same as a is equal to 2k for some integer k and the same is true when a is congruent to 1 modulo 2 2 divides a minus 1 which means that a minus 1 is equal to 2l for some integer l which means that a is equal to 2L plus 1. So that is why when A is congruent to 0 mod 2, A is even. When A is congruent to 1, A is odd. What happens if we work modulo 3? If we are dividing a number by 3, what are the only possible remainders? Our possible remainders are just 0, 1, and 2 because according to the division algorithm, the remainder has to be greater than or equal to 0 but less than N. And they are integers. In other words, r is just 0, 1, up to n minus 1. Hence, for any integer, an integer will either be congruent to 0 mod 3, 1 mod 3, or 2 mod 3. Equivalently, this means that 3 divides a. This means that... 3 divides a minus 1, and this is the same as saying that 3 divides a minus 2. 3 divides a, that's the same as a is equal to 3k for some k, where k is an integer, of course. Here we have a minus 1 is equal to, let's say, 3l. Again, l is an integer, and here a minus 2 is equal to, let's say, 3 m where m is an integer hence this means that a is of the form 3l plus 1 here a is of the form 3m plus 2 thus every integer is exactly one of these three forms for some integer k either exactly one of this can only be true either a can be written as 3k 3k plus 1 or 3k plus 2 we are now ready to prove this statement. If n is an integer, then 2n squared plus n plus 1 is not divisible by 3. Take note here that we are now dealing with divisibility by 3. Hence, I will not break my case into odd and even integers. I will now break my cases according to the remainder when n is divided by 3. Let us start with our proof. Let n be an integer. And we will now start with the cases. For the first case, assume n is equal to 3k for some integer k. Take note that this is just saying that n is divisible by 3. The remainder is equal to 0. Plugging this in 2n squared plus n plus 1, we get 2 times 3k squared plus 3k plus 1, which is equal to 18k squared plus 3k plus 1. What can we now say about this 18k squared plus 3k plus 1? Is this not divisible by 3? How do we show that it is not divisible by 3? We should write it in the form 3 times something and then plus a remainder. What is that? We can write this at 6k squared plus k. That's 18k squared plus 3k and then my plus 1 is here. Meaning to say the remainder when 2n squared plus n plus 1 is divided by 3 is equal to 1. So therefore, 2n squared plus n plus 1 is not divisible by 3. 
For our second case, we assume that the remainder of n when divided by 3 is 1. That is, assume that n is equal to 3k plus 1 for some integer k. Take note that it's okay if I use the same k that I used here because the scope of k here is just up to this proof only, for case 1 only. Let us continue. Similarly, just like in case 1, we get 2n squared plus n plus 1 is equal to 2 times 3k plus 1 squared plus 3k plus 1 plus 1. When we simplify this, we get 18k squared plus 15k plus 4. Let us now write it as 3 times something plus an integer. And what is this? We can write it as 3 times 6k squared plus 5k and then my 4 is 3 plus 1. So I have 3 and then plus 1 here. So for cases 1 and 2, the remainder is equal to 1. So I get the same conclusion. It is not divisible by 3. For case 3, that is left as an exercise. What will happen here is that 2n squared plus n plus 1 has a remainder of 2 when divided by 3. For our next example, we want to show that if m is an integer, m cubed is equal to m modulo 3. Take note again that we are dealing with modulo 3, so we will follow the same technique that we used in the previous example. We will divide the cases wherein m has a remainder of 0, 1, or 2. Let us start with our premise. Suppose m is an integer and we will now proceed with our cases. Case 1, assume that m is equal to 3k for some k. For k is an integer, of course. What is it that we want to show? We want to show that in all of the cases, we will get that 3 divides m cubed minus m. That is our conclusion here. That is... We can write m cubed minus m as 3 times an integer. Now that we already know where we want to go, let us continue. Again, we are assuming that m is equal to 3k. Plugging this value, we get that m cubed minus m is equal to 3k cubed minus 3k. And this is 27k cubed minus 3k, which is, of course, a multiple of 3. That's 9k cubed minus k. Hence, m cubed is congruent to m mod 3. Let me do another case. When m has a remainder of 1 m is equal to 3k plus 1 for some integer k. Just like what we did in case 1, we get that m cubed minus m is equal to 3k plus 1 cubed minus 3k plus 1. Take note that there is no need to expand the cube of 3k plus 1. I have a common factor of 3k plus 1. So I will just write it as 3k plus 1 times... 3k plus 1 squared minus 1. This is 9k squared plus 6k, but I have 1 minus 1, which is 0. No need to expand this because remember, what is our goal? We want to write it as 3 times an integer. I already have a factor of 3 here. So that's 3k plus 1, and this becomes 3k squared plus... 2k. So therefore, m cube is congruent to m mod 3 in this case. And case 3 is left as an exercise. 
For case 3, the assumption there is that m is equal to 3k plus 2. It has a remainder of 2. For our next example, let n be an integer. If 3 does not divide n, then 3 divides 2n squared plus 1. What will be our cases here? 3 does not divide n. It means that n has a remainder of, what are the possible remainders? 1 or 2 only. It cannot happen that it has a remainder of 0. So therefore, for this one, we have just two cases. Let me just copy this part here. Let n be an integer. Of course, we will write our assumption. Suppose that 3 does not divide n. Once you have written that, you can now say that you have the following cases. If you forgot to write this, let n be an integer, and then you will proceed with your cases then you should have three cases. But that means that you forgot this premise over here. Let us continue. Assume n is equal to 3k plus 1 for some integer k. What is it that we want? Our goal is to show that 2n squared plus 1 is equal to 3 times an integer. So we will look at 2n squared plus 1. I will no longer write some of the words. You will be the one to fill that up. So plugging in 3k plus 1, we get 2 times 3k plus 1 squared plus 1, which is 2 times 9k squared plus 6k plus 1 plus 1. And this is 18k squared plus 12k plus 2 plus 1, which is 3. And therefore, it has a factor of 3. Hence, 3 divides 2n squared plus 1. Next, for our second case, Assume n is equal to 3k plus 2 for some integer k. If we plug that into n squared plus 1, what will we get? We will get 18k squared plus 12k plus 9, which has again a factor of 3. That's 6k squared plus 4k plus 3. So in this case, we also get that 3 divides 2n squared plus 1. So again, you can conclude by saying that in both cases, we have shown that 3 divides 2n squared plus 1. That concludes your proof. We have just finished proving an implication wherein the premise is a disjunction. R or S implies T. The next thing that we want to consider is when the conclusion is a disjunction. Take note that this statement R implies S or T is equivalent to the following. R and not S implies T or R and not T implies S. What do these two statements mean? This is just saying that you assume R and negate one of the statements in the conclusion and then show that the remaining statement must be true. I leave it up to you as an exercise. This is an exercise to show that these are equivalent. But what does this mean? If we are using the direct proof of R implies S or T, we would start with assume R, correct? And then show that S or T is true. If S is false and T is true, then S or T is really true. That is what is happening here. If you are not S, then you must be T. Or if you are not T, then you must be S. Let us consider this example. Let A and B be real numbers. If A be equal 0, then A equal 0 or B equal 0. Look at, so this is of the form R implies S or I know that you are very much familiar with this theorem. You've used this in algebra. But let's just 
prove this formally using the proof techniques that we have learned. How will we proceed? Let us first copy this hypothesis here. Let A and B be real numbers. And then we suppose our premise AB is equal to zero. And then what should we do? We negate one of our statements here. We negate either A equals zero or B equals zero. Let's just suppose that we assume that A is not equal to zero. So I will put it here. Suppose A B equals zero and A is not equal to zero. What is it that we want to show now? We will show that. If this is false, we assume that this is true and this is false, we must show that we have no other option but B to be equal to 0. Or that is the same as proving this implication R and not S. This is my R and this is my not S. That became my premise and then my conclusion is T. Take note that this is much easier to work with. It's better to have a lot of premise and then, then you only have one conclusion instead of having one premise and then for your conclusion you have two statements there. Anyway, going back, suppose A B equals 0 and A is not equal to 0. How do we show that B is equal to 0? Take note that A is not equal to 0 is important here because what will we do with A B equals 0? We will multiply... 1 over a to both sides and we cannot do that if a is equal to 0. So I will write that explicitly since a is not equal to 0, 1 over a is a real number, right? This is defined. So multiplying 1 over a to both sides of the equation We get 1 over a times a b and then 1 over a here. So we get that b is equal to 0. So this is an example of proving this statement wherein we use this. We negated one of these components and then showed that the remaining component must be true. Let us look at this last statement here. This is saying that in order to show this, we have to show that R implies S, one of the components, or R implies T. This one actually involves proof by cases. For example, R is P or Q, meaning to say this is my case 1, P and then Q. So for case 1, so I have assume P. And then I will show at the end that S is true. And then for case 2, assume Q. And then at the end, I will show that the other component is true. Show that T is true. Take note that this is different from what we had earlier. When we had our proof by cases before we were proving, let's say, case 1 and then case 2 then at the end you have therefore s and then here you have therefore s you have the same conclusion this is saying that you are proving the premise implies s only one conclusion however what i'm just telling you is that if you get different conclusions for your different cases, it means that the conclusion of your premise is the disjunction of the statements that you get. Let me illustrate that by an example. Let m be an odd integer. Then m is equal to 1 mod 4 or m is equal to 3 mod 4. Let me just first show you our proof strategy. This is not yet the formal proof. I just want to guide you how our proof will flow. If we just go directly, let m be an odd integer. So we will write m equals 2k plus 1 for some k 
element of z. How will we achieve this one? m is congruent to 1 mod 4. This is equivalent in saying that m is equal to 4k plus 1. Correct? There you mean there is 1. And then here, m is equal to 4k plus 3 for some integer k. Either this or this. It's as if we can't do anything if we just look at m equals 2k plus 1. How will we get a 4? I will now divide my k here into two cases, odd and even, so that I will have a 2 here. So for my case 1, k is even, and for case 2, k is odd. Again, this is just a scratch or proof strategy. So I have here 2 times, let's call this L. Since k is even, k is equal to 2L. So I get m is equal to 4L plus 1. What about if k is odd? That is, k is equal to 2L plus 1 for some integer L. So my m is equal to 2 times 2L plus 1 plus 1, which is equal to 4L plus 3. See the difference? Now, look at what you have here. For case 1, you ended up with m equals 4l plus 1. For case 2, you ended up with m is equal to 4l plus 3. What happened here? You started with let m be an odd integer. You divided it into two different cases. And you achieve two different conclusions. That means that the final conclusion here is that m is equal to 4l plus 1 or m is equal to 4l plus 3. Let me now write the final proof of this. Let us start with our premise. Let m be an odd integer. Then m is equal to 2k plus 1 for some integer k and then we proceed by proof by cases case one assume k is even so that is k is equal to 2l for some integer l and so m is equal to 2 times 2l plus 1 which is equal to 4l plus 1. So thus, m is congruent to 1 mod 4. For the second case, assume k is odd. Hence, k is equal to 2l plus 1 for some integer l. So m is equal to 2 times 2L plus 1 plus 1, which is equal to 4L plus 3. Thus, M is congruent to 3 mod 4. Therefore, M is congruent to 1 mod 4 or M is congruent to 3 mod 4. That concludes your proof.